Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at Jadavpur University. In this module on the African and Caribbean drama written in English, we have three objectives. Firstly, to look at the historical development of theatre in Africa and in the Caribbeans in the English speaking areas in particular. Secondly, to look at the interactions of various local and global resources and sources. And finally, to locate the various genres of theatre now practiced in these areas and resulting from the interaction between the local sources and the global sources. This will allow the student to place the individual literary theatre that she reads within this larger context. We begin with an overview of Anglophone theatre in Africa. As we have discussed in the introductory modules 1 and 2, colonial cultural policy and resistance to it by the colonized created a situation of tension and confrontation between indigenous artistic resources and the imposed colonial culture. The indigenous theatrical resources interacted with colonial influences, leading to different theatrical genres flourishing in Africa. Anglophone African theatre can hence be properly called post-colonial, that is theatre that followed colonial contact and not theatre that was composed only after the departure of the colonizer. The reasons for this are, first, the language and the form of this theatre was introduced by the colonizers and second, both indigenous and foreign influences were growing and equally important in moulding new forms of theatre in a non-African language, that is English. This situation became possible only after colonial contact. Anglophone Caribbean theatre is even more specific because three different kinds of people inhabited the Caribbean and their various legacies and varied social positions were reflected in the drama as in other verbal arts. The native Amerindians were almost wiped out by the coming of the European colonizers. The Europeans and the Asians who chose to come to the Caribbean in pursuit of wealth or employment in plantation agriculture came of their own choice and could leave when they wanted to. But the Africans who were forced to come there as slaves had no escape route. They did not have the privilege of returning home and were forced to remain in the islands. Like all art forms, the theatre in the Caribbean originally reflected the racially stratified hierarchical society of the islands. Let us look at the sources of Anglophone African theatre. The sources of theatre on the African continent belong to two broad groups, the indigenous and local sources and those that were introduced by the colonizers. Among the local indigenous sources, again, two different forms may be identified. Broadly, the ritual theatres related to religious worship, seasonal cycles and community festivals and secondly the local non-colonial performance forms which were not related to religion. These were orally transmitted verbal art and traditions which were practiced by professionals in the pre-colonial courts and community gatherings. Irol Hill has pointed out that ritual performances addresses the gods and the supernatural while secular performances addresses other human beings. Joel Adetji has explained the process by which ritual theatre becomes festival theatre and festival theatre fragments into professional and amateur productions of secular theatre. Over time, the religious purpose of the performance may diminish and the seasonal enactment would continue because people have become accustomed to it as a traditional event. Thus, we have conditions 
for ritual theatre turning into festival theatre. However, these traditions of performance were not considered as theatre by the makers of colonial policy or by theatre critics from the West. The reasons for this are firstly, the ritual and festival and community performances and oral art forms accompanied by dance or music with little dialogue in the western sense were completely unlike the scripted well-made plays of England. Secondly, indigenous performances were not held in auditoriums with a proscenium stage, a curtains and a ticketed audience. Theatre occurred in ritual space or in public space and everybody was welcome and free to attend. Thirdly, the ritual and festival performances went on for days unlike western theatre which was a social occasion for which one had to dress appropriately and go to an auditorium. Going to the theatre was an occasion in the west whereas the performance was a part of everyday life in African societies. As part of their mission to civilize the savage Africans, the colonizers introduced English education as we have discussed. One of the chief elements of this education was in fact theatre and this induced the English educated Africans to emulate and participate in the drama and the theatrical practices that the colonizers imported. Much of Anglophone theatre that emerged during the anti-colonial nationalist struggle and after decolonization was fueled by a desire to replace or remake colonial institutions and theatre practices with African forms and institutions. Thus, using the indigenous resources to articulate problems, insights and dilemmas left behind by the colonizers and exacerbated by the vagaries of post-independence society. Sources of theatre in the Caribbean owe much to theatre in Africa. The ritual and festival theatres of Africa influenced the customs related to agricultural cycles or Christian traditions introduced by the colonizers. For instance, the carnival was introduced by the colonizers into the colonies, but once adopted by the Afro-Caribbeans, it was transformed into an expression of surviving African traditions colored by local experience. Other festivals associated with the vegetation cycle such as the crop over in Barbados or with the liturgical calendar like the Christmas John Conu festival in Jamaica, the La Rose flower festival in St. Lucia or the Tramp in Guyana all colour European implants into the agricultural colonies with strong traditional expressions drawn from Afro-Caribbean life. Another aspect or another source of theatre in the Caribbean is the storytelling and the pantomime which were residues of African performative and oral arts preserved in the memory of the slaves and refigured to reflect the realities of the life of slavery on the plantations. Besides this, there was also the influence of the colonial culture. The western forms were assimilated into the African memories and practices. This occurred in two stages. The first of which was the appropriation of forms like minstrelsy and the cambule in America and in the Caribbean respectively. People of African origin adopted these forms even though they denigrated the blacks because they had enormous indoctrination and resistance potential. So effective was this indoctrination that even when the forms became eventually appropriated by the slaves, they introduced only little variation into the practice. The Caribbean version of the Kambule practiced by the people of African descent was different from the minstrelsy in the sense that the objective was no longer to caricature the blacks but to publicize the yoke and the oppression and exploitation of slavery and respond to life 
under this condition. This altered orientation of the Caribbean Cambule provoked hostility from the same white critics who lavished applause on the form when it was used by whites to denigrate blacks. In the second stage of the progress of Caribbean culture, Caribbean artists trained themselves in the arts of the colonial culture to such a level that they were charged with imitation or mimicry. However, a synthesis occurred between the African influences and the European influences producing in the Caribbean a theatre that was rooted in the history and life of the islands. Let us now consider the common characteristics of African and Caribbean theatre in the Anglophone areas. Despite the similarity of sources and a common colonial legacy, the theatre of the Anglophone areas of Africa differ according to ethnic groups because of the difference in language and in indigenous performance traditions, which directly influence the form and the content of modern theatre in Anglophone African societies. This may be seen as a primary characteristic of Anglophone African theatre. For example, the Uruba and the Igbo nationalities were part of the British West African protectorate and now they are parts of a single nation, Nigeria. Both were influenced by the colonial theatre of England which was taught and practiced in the English medium schools and universities as part of the civilizing mission of the colonizers. However, the Caribbean heterogeneity was based in a certain commonality. Despite the heterogeneity of the Caribbean slave communities, Africa was a unif unifying factor across the Caribbean islands. The role played by African traditions in Caribbean drama, as in all Caribbean literature by writers of African descent, was a symbolic marker of the past of a common and lost home. Finally, a Caribbean aesthetic emerged on this basis, independent of both African and Western paradigms, but combining with the lived experience and the history of the islands. There is thus a commonality in types and forms of traditional per performance arts which have been adopted as part of the modern Europhone theatre in Africa and the Caribbean. What we consider next are precisely these commonalities. The first form that we may consider is the masquerade. Masks are used for different purposes, the most important being to facilitate the passage of spirits from the other world into the human world. The performances are scheduled at certain dates, periods and venues. Just as dramatists perform in theatres, masquerades at village squares or arenas specially marked out by the people. The human performer embodies a particular ancestral spirit when he dons a mask and hence acquires great social and spiritual power. He is no longer a mere human being. We see this in Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart when Okonkwo dons the mask even though everyone can recognize his voice, nobody even dreams of thinking that this is Okonkwo because the spirit of the mask is speaking through his voice. So the complicity of the audience in the performance is a key feature of the masquerade. This form of role playing is called the theatre of complicity. Though the spectators know and recognize the human being behind the mask, they behave as if he is really a supernatural power. Therefore, they are complicit in his impersonation and that is why it is called the theatre of, of complicity. Since the masks are always supported by a chorus and the masked dance or the masquerade is accompanied by music, the theatrical elements are pronounced. We can see examples of the masquerade as a dramatic device in Woli Shoinka's Dance of the Forest and in The Road. 
In Shoinka's death and the king's horsemen, the fear of desecrating the mask by using it as a mere disguise or a fancy dress shows the power of the mask and its potential to elevate performance above the mundane into the realm of the spirit. In the Caribbean too, the carnival retains the use of the masquerade as a symbol of tremendous power for audiences that harbour a belief in the efficacy of gods and spirits. The Trinidad Carnival has produced a number of traditional masquerades, each with a characteristic oration, gesture, mime and dance. The second common characteristic that we will discuss is the influence of local oral genres. Many ethnic communities on the African continent have similar forms of orally transmitted and composed verbal art which differ by language and custom but are occasioned by similar geographical location, beliefs or social systems. Examples include the hunter's songs which among the Uruba are called Ijala and among the neighboring Igbo called Egbenuoba. The songs of praise and insult like the Oriki among the Uruba or the Izibongo among the Zulu. Invocations and prayers to gods, animal tales common amongst different groups and the characteristics associated with animals varying according to the status of the animal among the community. In the Caribbean, some of these features still survive. For example, the Trinidad Pantomimes 1949 production of Brer Anansi. The popular character of Anansi is borrowed from the Ghanaian popular character Anansi the spider who lives by his wits and whose stories are popular among the Akan speaking peoples of Ghana. Thirdly, another common source is the influence of the Christian churches. The European civilizing mission in Africa was spearheaded by the Christian missionaries who were first to set up schools for the colonized and thus they became the pioneers of colonial education. The church actively opposed all forms of indigenous performance and all oral arts. Dances, masquerades, ritual performances and orature were all forcibly banned and an alternative civilized culture was manufactured to put in its place. The contours of this civilized culture influence the contemporary African theater. In A Child of Two Worlds, the Kenyan writer Mugo Gatheru remembers from his childhood the difference between African forms of worship which included songs, dances, music and going into a trance and the sober, musicless services of the Christian church. As African converts grew in number, they gradually transformed this sober Christian service into a participatory musical bonanza. The nature of worship changed and the use of music in the church increased. The first professional theatres in Nigeria were companies created by Uruba actor managers like Hubert Ogande, Kola Ogunmola and Juro Ladipo. All of these dramatists were teachers involved in dramatizing Bible stories in the African Christian churches. For example, Ogande's first production was called The Garden of Eden. It was produced in 1944 and staged in the Church of the Lord in Lagos in Nigeria. In the Caribbean too, among those who worked hardest for slave liberation were people prominent in demanding the suppression of the so-called slave culture and for the same reasons. They believed that the slave culture with dance and music obstructed the progress of civilization and was derogatory to the dignity of free men. These attacks only served to alienate the slaves and strengthen them in their resolve to protect their cultural forms. The fourth common characteristic that we note is the influence of English education. We have discussed this at length in earlier modules. 
This phenomenon has been described by Ngugi Wa Thiongo in his prison memoir called Detained. Here the playwright remembers the school production of English plays with elaborate sets, a proscenium box stage and plays written by George Bernard Shaw and Noel Coward. Ngugi's view is that these plays were introduced to counter the upsurge of anti-colonial indigenous performance arts, which were patriotic forms which questioned and resisted colonization. This is what Ngugi has called a colonization of the mind, created by the English educated class who could serve as functionaries for the colonial state. But this also exposed the Anglophone African student to what the Western world termed theatre and prompted many now established playwrights to attempt a convergence between the stage or the proscenium form and the indigenous local performance forms. This characterizes the work of the first generation of Anglophone African playwrights like Efua Sutherland, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, Wole Soinka, Amata Aidu, Ola Rotimi, etc. In the Caribbean, Western education provided the only means by which former slaves could hope to attain a place in the social hierarchy. Western forms were assimilated as a function of the indoctrination relating to Western textual and aesthetic paradigms. This indoctrination was also sociologically conditioned. The language and form of this induction were also Western. The earliest plays in the Anglophone areas of the Caribbean were thus part of the art theatre imitating the British. Another influence on both African and Caribbean theatre was world theatre itself. Of course, the most important figure in world theatre that was available to the English speaking audience was Shakespeare. And Shakespeare formed an important part of the civilizing education which the colonizer offered. But as the Nigerian playwright Kole Omotoso points out, it was not until the high school student reached his postgraduate years that he discovered that Shakespeare could actually be performed on stage because earlier he had only read Shakespeare as a literary text. According to Omotoso, it is only in the postgraduate years that the high school student also learned to connect Shakespeare with the local performance forms around him. And so, he used both the resources of the local communities and the resources of the stage offered by Shakespeare to craft a form of theatre which was indigenous to Africa. Besides translations, adaptations of Shakespeare in English, using indigenous forms which were written in Caribbean and in Africa. There were also world classics in theatre which were adopted or adapted. For example, Oedipus Rex was adapted to a play called The Song of a Goat written by J.P. Clarke of Nigeria. Wole Shoinka of Nigeria adapted Euripides' Bakhe and called it the Bakhe of Euripides. Besides this, Efua Sutherland and Jody Graft of Ghana adapted indigenous forms into, in, into the English language. The adaptation of foreign material led to a discussion of whether the ethos of the text should be changed to suit the local audiences or whether the text should simply be translated. And this was a way of connecting emerging African theatre in Europhone languages to world theatre. The early Caribbean artists, by virtue of their plural roots and access to diverse cultures, were natural assimilators, knowing the literature of empires, Greek, Roman, British, through their essential classics, as Walcott said. This ability, said Walcott, caused them to be branded among other uncomplimentary terms as traitors. The criticism of Caribbean life and aesthetic potential in Eurocentric discourse, as well as the criticism of early Caribbean output by Caribbeans themselves, 
led finally to the forging of a Caribbean aesthetic. One of the most striking common characteristics of African and Caribbean theatre is what Bertolt Brecht would have called total theatre. This is the principle of integration of theatrical elements. Vocal, choral, musical, visual and kinetic which were common to existing African performance arts. This kind of total theatre was amenable to performance outside the proscenium stage in the center of a community as was the common practice in local African communities. The most notable instance of Caribbean integrated theatre is the Jamaica pantomime first introduced by the little theatre movement in 1941. Having looked at the common sources of African and Caribbean theatre, let us look at the different theatre genres that are practiced first in post-colonial Africa and then in the post-colonial Caribbean. Turning to Africa, the first genre that we will consider is what is known as the syncretic theatre. Traditionally, in Western and Southern Africa, ceremonial theatre for entertainment was provided by travelling players like the Alarinjo in Urubaland. And the Alarinjo performances consisted of music, dancing, drumming and acting. In contemporary times, syncretic theatre inspired by local forms and Western influence like the South African dance drama form Malipenge emerged from these traditional entertainment theatres. Examples in both local languages and in English include the Nigerian Concert Party Theatre, which is the theatre of Hubert Ogande and, the Juro La and Juro Ladipo, the Ghanaian Storytelling Theatre of Efua Sutherland, the travelling South African Musical Theatre of Gibson Kente and the Sierra Leonean Trans Dama form in Creo. The next form of theatre that we may consider is the literary theatre. Dramatists exposed to Western theatre practices as well as local performance forms and educated and writing in the colonizer's language formed this kind of theatre. Akinwande, Olovole Soenka, Ama Ata Aidu, J.P. Clark were the earliest practitioners of the literary theatre. Femi Osofisan, Bodiso Wande, Tess Onowueme, all Nigerian dramatists attempt to mould both language and form learnt from the colonizer with speech rhythms, oratures and performance forms of their communities. Then we come to the theatre for development which is also known as community theatre. This was begun by the pioneering work done by Alec Dixon in the former Gold Coast which is now Ghana. Dixon worked as an educationist in the 1940s. He was mainly concerned with mass education, social welfare and community development programs. And this led him to use dramatic techniques to popularize these issues without being aware of the import of drama. His aim was to change the social atmosphere and empower the local people. Many like Zeke Smda in South Africa, Robert Serumaga in Uganda and the Rural Arts Program in Eritrea have followed this model of theatre for development using theatre to raise awareness about social issues. The Leedza Batanani popular theatre program in Botswana fused extension work with the performing arts. Leedza Batanani which in Setswana means the sun is already up, it is time to come together and work. This theatre started in the northern Bokalala region of Botswana. In the mid 1980s, following the scheme of improvisation practiced by the Botswana group, the Theatre for Community Development project began in Lesotho's National University. This community development project attempted to involve the communities in urban and rural areas as well as prison populations in urban and rural areas to create awareness about development issues through theatre. 
The next genre we consider is protest theatre. Protest theatre has its beginnings in the township theatre in apartheid South Africa as well as the hit and run theatre in Zambia. These are shaped in form and content by a situation which gives rise to protest. In South Africa, the ideology of apartheid separated the black from the white in all spheres of life including on stage. Black actors and white actors were not allowed to appear together. Breaking these laws invited direct punishment. Theatre practitioners like Ethol Fugard registered their protest by using the theatrical space to bring the blacks and the whites together. Fugard could not perform in his own country precisely because he had a mixed company of black and white actors. South African workshop plays like Woza Albert share similarities with Fugard's work which is more literary in language use but minimalist in form. The actor's bodies are often the only props since the performance space where blacks and whites could come together was always threatened by the possibility of police action by the apartheid state. So the theatre had to be a mobile theatre, a kind of agitational propagandist theatre which could perform in the midst of the community and disappear within the community should the police arrive to arrest them. The hit and run theatre, the name of the uh, form of hit and run theatre speaks for itself that was exactly the kind of form that was practiced in Zambia itself. The difference between Fugard's work and the agitational propaganda model which is an accepted mode of protest theatre is that Fugard performed in theatre halls across the world while agit prop is supposed to be performed in the midst of the audience. The hit and run theatre in Zimbabwe is conducted in the public sphere, the oppressed classes striving to keep protest and resistance hidden from the authorities. This is another form of agit prop, formally inspired by the theatre of the oppressed and its practitioner Augusto Boal. Another genre that we consider is the People's Theatre, Ngugi Wa Thiongo's project at Kamirithu Cultural Centre in Kenya aimed to write and produce plays in the local language Gikuyu instead of in English. Ngugi wanted the participation of the local community at every stage from building the auditorium to performing on stage and this introduced a new form of African theatre. These plays were performed in Gikuyu using the orators and performance forms of the community which was the audience and the producer. However, this effort landed Ngugi in jail. This proves that theatre in itself is a political act across Africa and the Caribbean. And finally, we are going to look at the indigenous theatre forms in the Caribbean and the modern genres that are practiced based upon these indigenous forms. First, the indigenous forms of theatre in the Caribbean. Theatre that grew out of the synthesis of European and African elements and located in the Caribbean had some broad common characteristics shared across the islands but varying according to the specific colonizer and the imposed culture as well as the particular history of colonization. Among these characteristics are firstly the representation of Africans, the complicated blend of desire and repudiation that colonial ideologues have shown towards England and English writers, the gendering of national and racial discourses, the evidently natural association of creole languages with folk or working class authenticity might appear from the vantage point of the latter half of the 19th century. The European and American theatres typified black characters as subordinates, often villains, romanticized as noble savages and always objects of ridicule. The first step on the road to a truly indigenous drama was for the Caribbean dramatists to write and perform plays about black people as central 
rather than as peripheral comic or villainous figures. The dramatic pageants of Marcus Garvey, staged at Edelweiss Park in Kingston, Jamaica in 1930, and the drama about Toussaint Louverture, the slave who led the Haitian Revolution, written by the Trinidadian historian C. L. R. James and performed in London in 1936, are amongst the earliest examples of this development in Anglophone Caribbean theatre. Caribbean plays also shared common generic markers. They overturned the prevailing view in the imported Western theatre that the concerns of black folk were most suited to comic interpretation and representation. Rather, they chose issues that were part of the common experience of the black folk and without removing the comic elements, they gave these concerns the serious consideration that they deserved. The 1938 drama Poco Mania by Uma, Una Marson showed the impact of a Jamaican religious cult on a staid middle class family, which is an early witness of this development. Language too formed a common basis in the Caribbean. Vernacular expression was first employed in drama as a way to ridicule the black peasant or working class characters who could not use what passed for standard English speech. Creole was used as a marker of authenticity in depicting the lowly status of the speaker. It was used by people of African descent, marking them as inferior and claiming that this was an authentic representation. This attitude contributed further to a widening of the cultural gap between the educated upper layer of Caribbean society and the broader base of the same society. The colonial emphasis on the value of good English was rejected by the local playwrights in favour of the vernacular to present the real lives of the Afro-Caribbeans bringing language into the area of anti-colonial politics, attempting to decolonize theatre as also other genres. Specifically, the role of the audience is an important element related to African performance traditions, especially oral storytelling in which the audience participates in the performance through the device of the call and the response, which means that the audience sometimes functions as a chorus or when the actor on stage says something and asks the audience to respond, then the audience participates in the performance by responding. Besides this, there is also the device of the salutation and the closure. Since the plays are not performed on a proscenium, the beginning cannot be signalled by the going up of the curtain and neither can the end be signalled by the going down of the curtain. So, instead of lights or curtains to mark the beginning and the end of performances, specific oral forms of salutation and closure are used. These are the genres that existed in Africa, which came through the transportation of slaves to the Caribbean into the Caribbean, mingled with the local traditions and were influenced by the traditions brought by the colonizer, which gave rise to Anglophone African and Caribbean theatre, which we could call post-colonial. In this module, we have discussed the indigenous sources of theatre that were transferred from Africa into the Caribbean islands. We have also talked about the influences of the colonial theatres both upon Anglophone African areas and upon Anglophone Caribbean areas.